This is Beyond Belief Sobriety, a podcast and community for people who are seeking or who have found a secular path to recovery from addictions of all kinds. Hello, thank you for taking your time to listen to this episode. I hope it's a good experience for you and that it helps add a little something extra to your stockpile of recovery capital. This episode was recorded a couple of years ago with my friend Ben when we were doing a podcast called My Secular Sobriety. We discontinued that podcast, oh, a few years ago, I guess, because doing one podcast at a time is quite frankly enough for me. This episode features a conversation that Ben and I had about how to handle Alcoholics Anonymous as an atheist or agnostic. It's a pretty interesting conversation. I think that you'll enjoy it, and it's worthwhile posting here on Beyond Belief Sobriety. But before we get into that, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Soberlink. If you're seeking a tangible way to maintain accountability and prove sobriety to loved ones, you have to try Soberlink. If you haven't heard of Soberlink, they've created a remote alcohol monitoring system that revolutionizes the way people document sobriety. This system includes a breathalyzer and uses artificial intelligence to display your test results in a calendar format, helping you analyze your habits and prove to yourself and others that you are, in fact, not drinking. It even has real-time results, facial recognition, and tamper detection, so no one will question the validity of your results. Soberlink and I have created a guide called Five Tools and Strategies for Those on a Secular Path to Recovery that you can find at Soberlink.com slash BBS. So if you're ready to take the next step in your recovery journey, mention the Beyond Belief Sobriety podcast when ordering Soberlink and you'll receive $50 off their device. And now, episode 266, How to Handle AA as an Atheist or Agnostic. Let's start on the assumption that a a person is listening who might have never been to an AA meeting before. Uh, They they think they have a problem with alcohol, and the only um, place they know of to find support is in AA. Uh, They don't have Life Ring. They don't have uh, Smart. They have AA. So... I guess we should let we should prepare those people, let them know what they will find when they get there. Why, why don't you start from your from your uh, perspective, and then um, I'll follow up uh, behind you. Sure. Well, first I'd note that depending on where you go, it's likely to be quite different depending on what meeting you walk into. Um, I would say around here, especially, they feel very. Um, you know, lots of times they take place in a church basement. So I think for a secular person that right there can kind of frame what they're walking into. And I think the if they do meet in church basements, they do tend to feel a little bit more like church, I think as well. Um, I think you can walk in and you can expect people to be very nice um, right off the bat. Usually a lot of people sticking their hand out to shake your hand, especially if they've never seen you before. And obviously if it's your first meeting walking in and you're checking things out, that's going to be the case. Uh, very welcoming, um, in general, that's, that's uh, what I would say. Um, and I would say after you're there for a while and maybe if you introduce yourself and if you're talking to people, um, people are pretty accepting for a while, I think. And you're right. Um, it, it, AA is, uh, unique, uh, among a lot of different organizations and that, um, what a lot of people don't realize about AA who aren't, aren't initiated into it or familiar with it is that, it really is a network of independent autonomous groups and AA is um, your experience with AA is going to depend upon what AA meeting you go to on what day, what time, what city, what state, what country it's, it's really based upon how that particular group runs their meeting and the norms of that area. So here in the Midwest and probably the actually probably most of North America, except for maybe a few places in the Northeast part of the country, what you're going to get at your first meeting, uh, people, people will, uh, like Ben said, will be very nice. 
they might give you what we call here um, a first step meeting, um, which might make you feel uncomfortable. And then again, it might make you feel it might it might be good for you to hear. But basically what that involves is people will go around the room. They will uh, tell their story of alcoholism and how they got into AA and in the hopes that you will identify with their stories and um, be attracted to um, what what is being offered there. The meeting will open with a prayer, which might make you uncomfortable if you have strong feelings about, um, you know, your secular worldview. It's generally around here opened with the serenity prayer, uh, which is a prayer that was written, I don't know, some time ago, back in the 30s, I guess. I don't know. But it's been kind of modified for AA. And then um, they'll go around the room and they'll share, they'll talk, talk to you. After the meeting, and this is very common in North America, not so common in Europe, they will um, ask you to hold hands, join in a circle, and recite the Lord's Prayer. And that that might make you uncomfortable, too. Um, <laughs> so that's just to prepare you for it. Uh, so it kind of depends on what you can tolerate. Now, you don't have to join in with the praying and so forth. Y- you have complete freedom to do whatever you want in AA. A lot of people say, you know, take what you can use and leave the rest. Sometimes that's easier said than done. But mm. Yeah, and I would say around here, too, I think um... – Meetings sometimes start with how it works, which is a chapter out of the out of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which definitely has some religious overtones to it as well. So that, again, that can be off putting to somebody who maybe has a secular worldview. All of us are different. Some of us are probably easier to find a little bit easier to put that by the wayside. But that's right. Um, it kind of depends, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, if you like in, in, in my case, I didn't grow up with uh, going to church or anything. So my discomfort wasn't so much as being um, uncomfortable with religion per se, but just just immediately feeling like I didn't have have that in common with them because I didn't have that experience. You know, I, I, I don't think I'd ever in my life joined hands with people and prayed before until I until I went to an AA meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that was. um yeah, it was kind of kind of different for me, uh, but I was able to tolerate it, I guess, because there weren't any other options. Yeah, I, I always find it interesting too. It's usually people who maybe have mental health issues too don't often like to hold hands with people or touch each other. So it's it, it can be kind of hard to get out of that purse circle true. at the end of the meeting. <laughs> That's true, and also uh, healthcare professionals really understand that holding hands is a good way of spreading germs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sure is. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine is a nurse, uh, and uh, she just she absolutely hates holding hands. <laughs> she just yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I would say too, you know, as I said, and you were talking more detail about what to expect in the meeting, but the tone will be very friendly usually right at first, like we were saying. And um, I find, you know, if you stick to your secular ideas or you don't buy into everything necessarily there, you start sharing things that people aren't aren't on board with. People will tolerate that for probably about one to three months. And then after a while, you might get some people saying some things back to you is yeah. that's been my experience. And you don't want to judge the entire group by one or two people either, because you, you will have the occasional um, person pull you aside and say, and tell you what you, they think you need to do. So um, they might be kind of condescending and, and tell you that eventually you'll, you'll get it. You'll, you'll, you'll find your higher power. Uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll make other suggestions and so forth. You don't have to follow any suggestions at all, um, and the person is probably really trying to be helpful. But if they, if if you find them off putting, it's not it's not fair to judge the entire group by that one person. In fact, you can, if you talk to someone about what that person told you and you have some questions about it, uh, there's probably some other people in the group that will tell you, yeah, stay away from that person or whatever. For sure. <laughs> Yeah. So. And I would say, don't be afraid to voice your concerns to another person in the group that you trust, just to kind of check out whether, you know, you're jiving with it or whether you think it's okay or not. And like John said, you'll, like you said, John, you'll, you'll get some feedback sometimes to say, oh yeah, everybody knows that guy's a little bit off kilter, or pushes things on people a little too hard. Don't worry about it. And if you have an open mind too, I think sometimes I would dig myself in when I was feeling especially secular, I think, but if you have an open mind, you start to realize 
that most people are just doing it however they see right. Right. fit to do or whatever's working for them, even though it doesn't always sound that way when they share in a meeting. That's right. And it's uh, the, the, the entire experience is, is one where um, over time you learn more and more about, well, you learn more about yourself, but you learn more about the culture of um, Alcoholics Anonymous too. And you, and you get better at navigating it, you know, and you definitely will learn uh, if you live in a, if you live in a large city, you'll definitely learn that there are a lot of different meetings you can go to. And some meetings are, are very um, strict and um, they have a certain way of doing things and, and everybody is kind of on board with that. And then you have other meetings that are really laid back and it's just, you know, do what you want to do. Um, I'm your friend. You know, it's just, it's real, it's real simple and easy. For sure. Um, and some meetings have a hundred or 150 people in them and they do feel like church or a big, huge uh, presentation. And other meetings might feel like small group therapy where it's like eight to right. 10 people and it's really laid back and casual. That's another good point too. You have different kinds of meetings, formats. You have speaker meetings that are usually open and then you have um, discussion meetings which are usually closed. And the difference between an open and a closed meeting is open meetings means that the public can, can show up. Anybody can, can attend the meeting and a closed meeting is only for people who want to stop drinking or think they have a problem with alcohol. Yeah. And even then there's not usually a lot of enforcement on that either. I don't think that's true. That's true. Depending on your group. I've had some groups too. I know I accidentally attended a women's meeting one time and I didn't know it was a women's meeting and they had a vote before the meeting to see whether I could stay or not. I did the same thing and they told me I yeah. could stay. And, uh, but I said, oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll let you guys do. Well, yeah. Did you stay? Uh, I did stay. Oh. <laughs> uh, I maybe shouldn't have, but, uh, no, most, people, was good. most people seem to be glad that I stayed, I guess at yeah. least, but maybe, I, maybe I just didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. So, yeah. So you had those two different types of meetings. Speaker meetings are kind of nice because, you know, all you have to do is sit there and, and listen. Uh, and then usually there's kind of like some kind of socialization after social socializing afterwards. But, that's in a nutshell, I guess, what you might expect to, to experience when you get to that first meeting. Now, Ben, you really pointed out the reading of how it works, which is really common. Um, and, I, you know, it might be really weird to hear that for the first time. And what he's talking about is it's from, it's from the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what the program is named after. And it's from a chapter in that book called um, How It Works. And it, it, it has this really heavy religious language where um, there is one who has all power that one is God may you find him now and what might be really strange for you though is some groups um, have t- have um, got the habit of um, speaking back to it when the person is reading it they say things in response to it <laughs> yeah so this I mean there's some weirdness there's no doubt about it but as Ben said when you when you started off all of that stuff you know is is not it doesn't represent the individual people. The individual people can be very nice. They're just people like, like anyone, like anyone you might meet in, 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 you know, out in the street. And when you go out and have coffee with them, you know, it's, it's, you'll, you'll find that it's just like pretty much anyone else that, that you might meet. And that to me, I think is the real strength of it is that personal connection that you have when you get away from all the other stuff, when you get away from the praying and the chanting and the, and the old book and all that kind of stuff. It's really the getting to know someone else who's going through what you're going through and has your best interest at heart, I think is what really is the power of it. Yeah, I think you're right too. And I, in general, I think it's true. You'll hear in meetings where people will say, none of us want anybody else here to go out and get drunk. And I do think that's generally true. You know, maybe after I've been there five years, there's a few people I didn't care for very well that I wished would, but that's when I'm at my worst probably. But, um, but truly, everybody does just want what's best for everybody there. But it usually revolves around not drinking for yeah. sure, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can call people too. You might have some people give you their phone numbers. Uh, and that, that's intended so that um, if you are thinking about drinking and having a hard time, you can, you can call someone. Mm-hmm. And um, Some meetings will hand you a list of people's numbers too at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that's basically in a, in a, in a nutshell, what you can expect. Then after you've been going to meetings for a while and let's say that you identify as either an atheist or an agnostic and you're, and you're beginning to meet people, you're, you see these 12 steps and there's a lot of stuff about God on there. 
Um, now, how do you navigate all of that? That's what. What would you say about that, Ben? Well, what I did <laughs> versus what I would say now, I don't yeah. know. I would say um, you and I have talked about this, and I do feel it's true. But I only feel it was true for me. I felt like after I stayed in meetings for a while and I started to absorb what was being said, I didn't ever, I mean, there were times I did sit down and work on the steps like I'm going to do this in a structured way, but I almost felt like the way the steps were listed started happening to me. I started thinking more about about different things and, and more deeply about my issues. Um, but a way to navigate that is there can be some really, really heavy God language and I don't know about you, John. The thing that bothers me about it is not when somebody says, this is my feeling about my higher power and how my program works. It's more when people use the you word and how you should do things and how we should do things. Yes. So I don't know. I always, I always recommend if somebody has had asked me to be a sponsor in the past and, and they're at meetings, I would always encourage them to talk in the I language. And I've since heard other people say that they don't like that either, but I think I think that's always healthy. My background in counseling says too, if, if I just say I feel this way about something, it's not me judging what somebody else should or shouldn't be doing. I just say this is how it works for me or this has been my experience so far. I agree. And if you hear people that talk in the we and they're, and in their we, they're including you, you don't have to be a part of that either. Just say that that's that, that's that person's idea of what we, we is. Right. I'm much more tolerant of we than I am of you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? And I know people mean the generic you, but it's right, uh, right. It's yeah. uh, some of my beefs with some things in Alcoholic Anon- Alcoholics Anonymous are that language is indicative of trying to press upon somebody else what they need to do rather than in an intent to me to avoid digging in and doing the work that, that the person maybe truly needs to do because it's about us resolving our feelings, not trying to make sure everybody has the same feelings we have. Yep. So after you've been going to meetings for a while, you know, let's say that you've been going to meetings, I would recommend that, you know, that you, that you go to meetings on a, if you're going to, if you're going to try AA, that you go to meetings on a pretty regular basis. I'd also recommend that you try a number of different groups and different meeting times uh, to find a place where you're most comfortable. And then after you've been doing that, let's say for about three or four months, then you might want to make a decision if you really want to go forward with working their, the suggested program, which is absolutely not required. And if you wanted to do that, um, there, there, I would take it very easy. Um, when you, those, those 12 steps, they're, they're written in a kind of an odd language because they were written so long ago and they were written by people who had a religious background, a religious. They they found sobriety through a religious experience, so that's why they're written that way. But when you look underneath all of the religious language, what's basically going on there? It's just uh, it's just an explanation of an experience that you might be able to relate relate to. You know, um, you might have had that experience where you really felt like, you know, you hit bottom, that you were desperate, you needed help, you couldn't do this on your own. Um, you know, you, you, you came to think that, you know, maybe there's something that can help me make a decision to change. These are, these are essentially what's involved with that. And they aren't necessarily things that you have to do. They're basically things that you've experienced. Um, the things that you actually do in AA, there's some, um, uh, when it comes to the steps, uh, there is some self examination, I guess, uh, some self reflection, some, um, trying to learn about yourself, how you, how you, um, react to different things in life. And it's kind of based upon looking back at your past, I guess, you know, and how you reacted to different situations. And, um, without really the intent is not to take, um, it's not to, you know, beat yourself up, but to try to understand if there's anything that you can change or learn from that, I guess, so that you can make life a little bit easier as a sober person. One thing I can really get behind in AA is the way they do break down your resentments and how they result in you finding something out about yourself. Um, Because if we do look at what's bothering us and why, we can find out the part of us that's that's being triggered or the problem in us that that is there. I I do think AA does spell that out pretty well in the book. You know, I get my halo again. It looks like there you are. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's uh, divine light coming in there. 
I was actually going to try to cover up my window because I knew this was going to happen, and uh, I broke that. My wife was going to kill me. I broke the Uh-oh. thing that uh, that uh, I broke something. <laughs> Uh-oh. Anyway, those are ne- those are never as cheap to fix as we'd like to think either. So yeah, it's uh, there. You know, I'm I'm definitely probably going to get into some bashing in this podcast about AA, but that that is one of the things I've always felt was pretty good about because it almost tr- it almost tricks you because when you get in, lots of times you're not. You're, you don't have as much insight into things as you can to be able to take a really hard look. Even, even if somebody went to therapy, it's hard to dig in that hard right away. So I think the subtle way it has you look at, hey, what's bothering you? And even, even the slogans and things you hear right at first are really helpful to just kind of quiet down the inner turmoil a little bit and get you to focus on yourself and not be so mad at everything around you. And you know what's interesting? If you look at other programs um, like um – for example, uh, refuge recovery, for example, um, there's a lot of what they call inventory and refuge recovery. It's a lot of understanding your, you know, how you react and to different situations and so forth, Under, get, understanding that and learning about it. Um, uh, I don't think that smart recovery is so much like that. Smart recovery isn't so concerned about the past or learning from the past, but they do pay attention to the, to your present reaction. You know, so it's all, it's real similar. I mean, it's still, it's still a matter of trying to understand yourself and how you operate. Right. I would argue too, though, and we talked about this in other podcasts and I didn't bring it up. The ABCs that are part of uh, smart recovery, where you look at the activating event, the belief about a, the event, the consequence of that belief, that is going backwards a little bit because you can look at that event that just happened and why do you feel this way? And then you can kind of see that pattern about, Oh, I tend to get mad about this certain situation in all instances in my life. So, so I think it does, it does eventually work back on some reflection. And like you and I have talked about, I think that naturally occurs it does, doesn't it? when you start, when you start um, having a more considered life where you're absolutely. examining things a little more. It absolutely does. There's no way around it. I don't think if you, if you if you have a problem with addiction of any kind, and you stop using, you're going to look back at your, at your time using, and you're going to, you're going to see that there were a lot of people that you impacted from your behavior. Um, and you're going to have problems in your life that is, is associated to um, your addiction. So it's just, you can't help but think back. And so if you're going to do that, you may as well find a way to do that in sort of a kind, gentle way so that you're not, you know, um, reeling in shame and self-hatred, but rather that you learn from it, relate that with other people who've experienced that, recognize your humanity, and then move forward with more more positive ways and, and, and hopefully mend some of those relationships. And I will say too, people will probably, if listening to this podcast, if you're considering going to an AA meeting, you might be at a different level of addiction than somebody else. Like you might be coming in just like, oh gosh, I've got an issue. I maybe need to take a look at, I need to go hear some things to make sure I don't have a problem or do have a problem. Or you could be somebody who's in full blown physical dependence where, you know, it's hard to even hold yourself together to get to a meeting. So um, the different kinds of needs you may have when you first come to a meeting somebody who might be barely able to hold it together and fighting off DTs, you might not, might not be as good for that person to speak in a meeting earlier because you're just more likely to be volatile and stuff like that. Now that being said, I'm in favor of anybody speaking in a meeting who feels like they need to, but um, you know um, some people might want to sit back a little bit more and, and check things out. And other people might want to just start introducing themselves and talking a lot right away. That's right. Yeah. I took it pretty easy. Um, I just, uh, I, I, well, I, I'm kind of an introvert, believe it or not. I'm an, I'm an introvert and I, uh, I don't know. I was just in a place in my life where I just didn't really feel like saying a whole lot. And so basically what I would do, I'd go to the meetings and I would leave just as soon as I could after the meeting. Um, it took me a little while to kind of warm up to people and get to know people and so forth. Now, after I did the real benefit I got from that was the relationships that I created Um, outside of the meeting time. So like when I started going out to lunch with people or going to movies with people and things like that, I was, I was pretty young. So that was really helpful for me, you know, to, to have people that were my age that were staying sober. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that goes on. Also there are young people's meetings for people who might be younger out there that tend to 
uh, that can can be good. Uh, some of those meetings would annoy the heck out of me when I was younger too. It felt like people didn't take things too seriously. But I think again, like you just said, John, that triggered me to say it. That community is huge. I think, especially when you're young, you feel like you're a loser if you can't drink anymore. And like, who the heck ever wants to hang out with you? And now you're boring and you have no life. And I really think that's where young people say a can be great for somebody who's who's younger like that. You know, it's funny. Um, so I got sober when I was 25. And so here I am in my mid to late 20s. And um, I didn't think that I, w- I was a young person. <laughs> now, now, looking back on it at the age of 57, it's like, yeah, I was I was pretty I probably qualified for the young people's meeting. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd, I'd say around here, young people's meetings, people are probably 35, 40 and right, under. Right, yeah. right. And then, you know, it's uh, there's lots of good things about AA and there's lots of things to, to be concerned about. But I think um, just stay out of the all or nothing thinking about it. it's either perfect or awful. I mean, if, you, if you're finding that you're liking what you're hearing on now, some level. If you're lucky enough, if you live in one of the cities that has a, a secularly formatted meeting, that's available too. Um, that's a really nice option. At a secular, at, they have these secular AA meetings. And we were talking about young people's meetings, women's meetings. There's also LGBTQ meetings, and there's what we call secular AA meetings. And a secular meeting is basically for people like us who have a secular worldview. And it's very nice because there aren't any opening and closing prayers. They generally stay away from the old um, literature. Um, it's just You just don't have that kind of pressure to conform to someone else's belief system as you do just naturally in a regular AA meeting. So if you're fortunate enough to have those, there's about 500 of those meetings around the world. So it's a very small fraction of the total number of AA meetings. But if you're lucky enough to have one, that's actually a really nice option. And I think what you'll find from that is that you, you'll you get the benefit of having like-minded people who support you in your sobriety. Um, it's the nice thing about AA is that if you, if you have a nice group, it's a very casual, almost fun interaction with other people. It's, it's, it's very laid back. It's not real structured, you know, so much. Um, so in that respect, it's nice. There's nobody teaching you or there shouldn't be anyway, um, at, at, at most meetings. So the secular option is really nice that you've got that. And you can go to this website, secularaa.org. And they have meeting list, meetings listed there. You can also just call the AA um, area where you live and ask if there's a secular meeting in, in, your, in their city. More and more um, uh, AA communities are recognizing the secular meetings. It's nice to have people that you look forward to seeing and going out to lunch with and things like that. And I'll say, I think from a male perspective, men aren't as likely to ask other men to go out to lunch or to go to a movie or just to hang out on their own outside of a meeting without the, without the structure of the meeting as, as women, I think. So I think for men, the, the meeting structure is good because I don't know, even when I drank, it's like guys had to have an excuse to go out to lunch or, you know, you go out, end up at a strip club or you go out and you play golf and you get drunk or you go here and you do this. It could never be that two men just wanted to hang out and talk to each other. You know, it wasn't as easy to do that. So I think, the format of or just having this meeting to go to like allows men to be around other men without, I guess we had another excuse to be around each other. It's an AA meeting, but um, for some reason we, I don't know if it's homophobia or what, we're just scared to connect with each other without some excuse on the other end of it. So by the way, if there's, a, if there is anyone listening and there might be two people in, on YouTube that are listening, you can call um, 844-899-8278. If you have a question or a comment, Go ahead and call. That's um, 844-899-8278. And that number is uh, also on the um, YouTube uh, page where, where we're streaming. So anyway, feel free to call in. So, yeah, I mean, so if you, if you, if you, if you can talk, if, if you can deal with, um, I mean, I think the matter, it's just a matter of being strong in your own belief system and not feeling like, don't feel any pressure to conform um, the one, one or two people who talk to you doesn't represent the whole, um, those steps you can take them or leave them, um, go, I would, I would, I would go into them kind of, um, with some caution, um, unless you have someone who also has a secular worldview with you. 
and maybe learn a little bit about them. And I think what you'll find out, like Ben and I just said, is a lot of them you're almost actually doing anyway. Um, so they're not, I mean, they're, they're nice, they're nice principles. I guess the strength of the, the steps is if there's any structure in AA, that might be it because it gives you a frame of reference or talking points, if you will. And that can, that can be problematic, but it also gives you some sort of a common language. Um, there's some strange stuff in AA. It's a, it's a, you know, when you might read about it being a cult and it is kind of cult ish in some ways in some groups more than others, because, but I don't, I don't really say it's a, I think it's more of a culture. It's just a, it's a, it's a subculture and they, ha- and they have their own way of, of uh, their own language, their own, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I am apt to think, I, I, I never would say like AA is a cult, but I do think there are very cult like tendencies in AA at times, you know, and you'll get, uh, if you're honest and assertive about what you believe. And I have counseling training. I've been pretty careful when I'm assertive about what I share in a meeting that I'm making sure that it's just me stating my opinion and not trying to press it upon anyone else. And I will thoroughly explain that before I share sometimes. Um, but still you, I'll get some pushback and I'll get some people talking to me after the meeting and I'll get people saying that I'm going to get people killed by saying stuff oh, yeah, sometimes. And to be honest, there are some groups, if you run into it, that are cults. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's, I mean, if you, we could do a whole show on AA cults, but there's, um, there's uh, the Clancy cult. Okay. So what this is, there's this guy in California by the name of Clancy. I, and he is a personality that a kind of he's got a charismatic personality. He's been around for a long time, and he's got a real um, rigid, dogmatic approach to recovery that demands that you have a sponsor and that you do what that sponsor says. Anyway, these groups are really weird in that they have this um, they have this heavy, hardcore sponsorship. Um, thing going on and they also have a dress code which is really bizarre <laughs> so you know it's just kind of strange so yeah if you get if you fall if you go to that group i would say go leave right i mean but you know i've known people that have gone to them and seem to like them but i don't know i don't if you're an atheist or agnostic i, I don't i think you would have a really hard time with a group like that yeah i think so too and those people tend to be able to like trace their sponsorship tree back to clancy or it's I almost mean, not not to knock religion but it's almost like mormonism in a way you know, because in Mormonism, you have like these ancestors that are like really. Oh, and I, what you would try to do, you try to save your ancestors, I think, so that you can go to heaven with them. That's the Mormon thing. I'm, I'm not, I don't know a lot about it, but that's why that they have the ancestor thing in Mormonism, and and these strange AA groups that do the <laughs> do the sponsorship thing. I don't know why they do it. They try to connect it back to this Clancy guy. I think. I suppose it's a validation thing, and I suppose it. some people would argue it gives you this sense of membership, and you're less likely to leave, and you're more likely to stay sober, and I'd be more likely to go crazy, I think. so. Yeah, so they do have cultish groups like that. So I bas- basically, if you ever have anybody tell you that you got to do something, I, I would stay away from them. Um, and then there's some more dangerous cults, too. I mean, there's more dangerous stuff like, um, oh, gosh, sexually, yeah, sexual stuff. 13 now, this is, stepping. Yeah. yeah, and this is you know it happens. It's not. I don't think it's the predominant vibe that happens in AA, but it's something to be aware of. There are self-appointed deacons of AA, kind of too. You know, my old home group that I went to, and I liked this gentleman for the first few years I went there, and then I think I kind of started to get a little more sane. And um, man, he would open the meeting every meeting, and it wasn't it wasn't a rule or a, or a, the way the meeting always worked. It just always happened that way. He would always start the meeting after whoever started the topic and he would speak for like 15, 20 minutes. And anybody who had been there longer than two years would just roll their eyes and be like, Oh my gosh, the gospel according to Rick. And uh, you know, it was uh, yeah, very dogmatic. And he was, uh, he was maybe what the book would call a, a, a classic alcoholic. He was just, very arrogant, very self-absorbed and like was not aware of how he was coming across to most people. And it was a big turnoff for a lot of people. Um, like I said, who had been around for a couple of years, you would find people drift away from that meeting. But on the other side of that, um, I think a lot of newcomers appreciate that structure and that 
I suppose, charismatic leadership that he brought to that group too. But um, yeah, it was definitely very, very off-putting after the first few years. Yep. So uh, speaking from my own experience and, and I'm totally am breaking anonymity and I'm okay with that nowadays, but um, I did get to the point where I, I really can't deal with the meetings quite frankly I can only handle a secular meeting but I I think for me I'm it's that way because I had spent a lot of time in AA um, conforming and I had the experience of conform going from conforming to not conforming and it was a difficult break Um, and it was it was almost it, it 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 was it was such the experience was such that it's hard for me to go back and be around the stuff that I used to conform to. And that does that make sense? It absolutely does, John. I think there's maybe a certain personality type or certain people who maybe the issues that we've had because that's that's been my experience too. What what I needed to do from a psychological standpoint was gain my own voice and have confidence in my own voice and my own beliefs because I had played the chameleon most of my life. And I think some of my drinking was to remove that, you know, I think, and, and own my own voice because I couldn't do it sober. So then I would drink and I mean, this is all subconscious stuff. I would drink and it would allow me to voice my own concerns. Um, but obviously when you're drunk, you don't do that in a very proper way. But then I think my early, my early involvement in AA, it was a lot of conforming and it was probably a, being physically sober was good for me, but for a while it was a furthering of me just conforming and, um, denying my own, um, my own journey and taking on somebody else's journey and what I thought it was supposed to be instead of digging in and finding what worked for me. And I think it finally called to me a little bit later. Sorry, that sounds too spiritual mumbo jumbo, but I think it's like a sliver that, that festers and it just begs to come to the surface. And I think once I was sober, there was no denying that. So I think first for me, when I started going to realizing there were secular meetings, it allowed me that um, voice, that, that freedom to be able to share what I'd been feeling for a long time. And um, I think getting more assertive and owning what I believed um, and not trying to change somebody else's belief was where my true growth needed to go. And I felt like the longer I was in traditional AA, the more that was being beat down and the more I was fighting against it. And so um, my ongoing growth has been one of growing away from AA on some level. Not that I couldn't go to a meeting today and probably find plenty that I agreed with, but, but it's almost like I can agree with the way something or what something is saying, but the way it is said is so off putting to me that it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard for me to find anything that I, that I agree with in a meeting and, and not just to be disagreeable, but just more than me which it goes on. And it makes sense. You know, um, I've been taking that life ring, not life ring, but um, smart training. And I, I learned a little bit about the stages of change and in smart. Um, I don't know if it's for, for the official stage of change, but one of the stages of change is the exit so that you've suc- you've successfully achieved the change. So that means you don't have to go on forever trying to change. You know, I guess you'd want to just maintain your, good habits or whatever. But yeah, I think that's part of the change. You you can grow out of it. Uh, of it. Right. Not necessarily. Well, I would, that'd be another argument I had against AA on some level too. It sets it up so that you're so scared that if you were to leave that, that it means you will drink, even if you're a person that's committed to not drinking, because that, that's me. I'm, I'm not necessarily committed to AA anymore on any level, but I am committed to knowing that I'm a person that, that is much better off if I don't even drink. So yeah. Now, if you're a secular person and you're going to AA and you don't have any secular AA meetings or any other secular option and you do have some problems with it and maybe people are giving you a hard time, there's another resource and that's, that's connecting with people online, other secular people online. And you can go like on Facebook, you know, and look up these um, private groups for secular people in AA. AA Beyond Belief is a site, AA Agnostica. These are sites that you can go to and connect with people who are, who will understand you, support you. There's even online uh, secular AA meetings. 
um, that you might like. I'm not, it's not, I don't like the online meetings for whatever reason. I just don't like them, but uh, they're not bad. I mean, it's, and it might, and it might be something that other people like. I don't know what I have against them. I just, for whatever reason, uh, they're just kind of not my thing. It's it's great for people who don't have access to anything to be able to at least have that um, that option. But I do think it's important the the face to face get-togethers and being in the same room with each other does something different. I think even you know in counseling and therapy right now that's a new trend of online therapy and things like that. And and you're you're going to miss that aspect of it too. Yep, absolutely. Better yeah. than nothing though. Better than nothing. Absolutely. Yep. So yeah, that online component is really nice because that way it gives you some strength. I think it's, e- it's probably easier to deal with when you know that you're not alone. You know, it's easier to like, I think the whole key is what you were saying, Ben, is being true to yourself and your own values and not trying to conform to someone else's. If you, could, if you can do that, then, then you're very healthy and you're going to be fine. It's when you compromise your own values that it, that damage is done and that kind of damage was done to me. So if you, and it makes it easier knowing that there are people out there that do share your values and that your values are good ones that you know, I think healthy. too, when there's other healthy people around you, they can reflect that back to you and you feel accepted for who you are. It's not that you're set in your own ways and you're good with it. So you don't need anyone. It's that, you can feel accepted by other people, even if they're not just like you. I mean, you think about the political climate right now, not to get into the politics of it, but it's like, just, it seems like there's less of that in the world as it is. Like if I believe differently than you politically, it's almost like we have to just ax people from our lives. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's an extreme, we live in a society of extremes anymore. Right. It's either. So, so I find in good recovery meetings, people tend to accept each other for their differences as well, is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So we've gone 40 minutes, which is probably about as long as we normally go. I hope that this was useful. We could have other discussions. There are, there are uh, things to, that we can explore here. But I think the bottom line is if you are a secular person and you, you go to AA, be, all, be true to your own values, um, go to other meetings, meet other people, just, you know, don't feel like you have to conform to what anybody says you need to do. Do what is helpful for you and find the people that you can relate to, that you can that you can invite into your circle of friends. And I think that you'll be OK. Avoid the people who are um, obviously cultish and um, the, the sexual people, <laughs> uh, yeah. the people that well, come think, on to you, I guess. <laughs> I think too, a, a good recovery community can be a way of separating yourself from the old, the old life you had too, where you feel like people didn't, aren't supporting your new changes that you maybe want to make by not drinking too, especially while you're transitioning to feeling comfortable with that. You might be able to return back to that, those friends as well, but you might find that those friendships weren't based on great things either. So there's a lot to sort out when we get sober. There is. So I hope this was helpful to you. Um, If not, we'll try it another time. That's another episode of Beyond Belief Sobriety. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to support our podcast with recurring monthly contributions, head on over to patreon.com slash beyond belief sobriety or become a member of our YouTube channel. If you'd like to make a one-time contribution, then visit our website beyond belief sobriety.com and click on the donate button. I do appreciate your support. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back again real soon with another episode of Beyond Belief Sobriety.